Today we're going to be talking about fast flux and why does the NSA suddenly consider it to be a national security threat? Now, I was a little bit surprised to hear the word fast flux being uttered because it's actually a really, really old technique. It was founded around 2005 and it became big in 2007. So this is the sort of thing that would have been on like a malware analysis quiz back when I was starting out in the industry. So it is really, really old. Now, I am going to have to apologize in advance because in order to explain how fast flux works, we have to explain a bit about how the internet works, or more specifically DNS, which uh, is short for the domain name system. Now this is how your computer resolves web addresses, because computers don't understand domain names. If I type google.com into my browser, my computer has no idea what that means, because computers talk to each other via IP address. So in order to connect to Google, I need to know the IP address of Google's server. And the way in which I get that is through the DNS system, the domain name system. So the DNS process typically involves four servers, a recursive DNS resolver, the root name name server, the TLD name server, and then the authoritative name server. Now the first step in the chain is I send a query to my ISP's DNS server saying, hey, where is google.com? And my ISP's DNS server doesn't know the answer, but it has a list of hard-coded root name servers. Now the root name servers are the servers that know where all of the TLD servers are or top level domain servers. So if you've got a domain like google.com, that's a .com domain, so that's gonna use the .com top level domain server. If you had a .org domain, it would use the .org server and so on. So the root name server knows which top level domain server to refer us to. So my ISP's DNS server is gonna ask the root name server, hey, where can I find google.com? And the root name server is gonna respond with the address of the .com top level domain server. And then my ISP's DNS server is gonna go and ask that server, hey, where can I find google.com? And again, that server doesn't know the answer, but it does know where the authoritative name server for google.com is, which is the server that they have configured to respond to DNS requests. Now, this could be something like a hosted DNS provider, or it could be their own DNS server. But whatever it is, that is the server that is the authoritative server, which means it has the authority to tell someone where google.com actually is. So the final step in the chain is my ISP's DNS server is gonna go and say, hey, where is google.com to the authoritative DNS server? And that server does know the answer. So it's gonna respond with an IP address and then that IP address is gonna be relayed back to my computer. And now that we have the IP of google.com, we can just connect to the server and we can begin browsing the website. So we have this sort of like four step process where my ISP's recursive DNS resolver is going to do recursive resolution. It's going to ask first the root name servers, then the top level domain server, and then finally it's gonna get the authoritative name server where it can get the official response. Now, in order to understand fast flux, we actually have to understand why the need for it arose, which means me putting on my grandpa hat and telling you stories of the days of old. Now, it used to be very, very hard to get a domain blocked or to get a domain revoked. It is still quite hard today, but it's a lot easier. There were things known as bulletproof registrars, which would allow you to register domains. And then if they received a legal request asking them to take down the domain, they would just be like, no. Back then, a lot of cybersecurity revolved around blocking IP addresses. Because if a server was hosting malicious software or phishing or some other badness, one of two things was gonna happen. You were gonna report it to the server owner and they were gonna take down the server because no one wants to be hosting illegal stuff. Or you would report it to the server owner and they would tell you no. And that was something known as bulletproof hosting. It was hosting that would not respond to legal takedown requests. They would actually allow their customers to host illegal things and then just refuse any request to take it down. So what security vendors started doing is, well, they would just block those IP addresses because if a service's whole business model is just hosting illegal stuff, you probably don't wanna be interacting with it. So they would just block the Bulletproof hosts' IP address or their IP address range. It was pretty easy to do. 
So the Bulletproof hosters needed a solution, and that solution was, well, we need more IP addresses. But the problem is IP addresses are kind of hard to get. It's kind of hard to just change your server IP address every day so that it doesn't end up in a block list. So what they would start doing is actually hiding their servers. Now this relies on something known as a reverse proxy. Now reverse proxy servers work in much of the same way that proxy servers do. You connect to the proxy server, you send a request, the proxy server forwards that request to the real server, the real server replies to the proxy server, and then the proxy server forwards that response back to you. So it's a layer of abstraction. Now this also works with websites. You can set up web proxy servers. So with a web proxy server, I would set up a server that's only job is to forward requests to my real server, and then relay the responses back to whoever sent the request. Now in practice, what would happen is the threat actor would set up their domain to point to the IP address of the proxy server rather than their real server. So whenever a client connected to the proxy server, it would send a request, the proxy server would quietly forward that request to the real server, the real server would respond to the proxy server, and the proxy server would respond with the request back to the client. So from the client's perspective, all they see is the proxy server. As far as they know, the proxy server is the real server. There is very little evidence that it is actually forwarding requests to another server. And that does two things. First, it protects your real server from getting taken down because all the client sees is the IP address of the proxy server. And also it prevents your real server from being blocked. It can't be in any IP block list if no one knows its IP address. But there's still a problem. We still only have one IP address. Sure, we could just keep setting up new proxy servers because setting up a proxy server is a lot easier than setting up a real server, installing database software, importing all the data, setting up a website. With a proxy server, you can basically just set it up with a single command. But you don't really want to go out and buy a hundred different proxy servers just to get a hundred different IP addresses. So what a lot of threat actors would do is they would use hacked computers, essentially botnet zombies. They would build botnets of thousands of hacked computers and they would install the proxy servers on the hacked computers. And that gives them access to a lot of IP addresses because if you've hacked say a thousand computers and some of those computers have dynamic IP addresses that change daily, you could potentially have tens of thousands of IP addresses at your disposal. But the question is, how do I get my domain to point to some random person's computer? That's gonna be a problem because they're probably gonna turn off their computer at night and now my website doesn't work. So that's where the idea of FastFlux was born. Essentially, when you make a normal DNS query, it comes back with a TTL value or a time to live. Now the time to live value tells the DNS server how long to cache that request. So if the response had a TTL of 30 minutes and we tried to query the same domain again, it's not going to go through that whole query process. And that's a bit of a problem. So what people started doing is they started setting the TTL value to zero, which means don't cache this request at all. Every time someone looks up your domain, it results in going through that full query process to the root name server and then to the TLD server and then to the authoritative name server. And typically you don't want that because it generates a ton of DNS queries and most of the DNS providers don't want to deal with that. So a lot of them actually don't allow that, but we'll get to that later. Essentially what the threat actors would do is they would set their domains time to live to zero and then they would configure their DNS server to every time a computer went offline, it would just respond with the IP address of a different computer. So they basically would have this network where every time you queried their malicious domain, it would respond with a different IP address, a different hacked computer, which would simply act as a proxy relaying requests to their real server. So from the perspective of a security professional, all you see is a domain that responds with thousands of different IP addresses that are constantly changing. And that's very hard to take down and it's also very hard to block. If the threat actor is using hacked computers, you can't just show up at their house and seize their computer like you could with a malicious server. There's a lot more of a legal process involved. So it wasn't at all realistic to go and take down a thousand hacked computers. 
So this became a bit of a problem. It's like, well, how do we keep track of thousands and thousands of malicious IP addresses to block? And how do we find the real server in order to take it down? Or can we even take it down? Because it's probably hosted on a bulletproof hoster. So what security experts did is they started blocking the DNS server. Because as I mentioned earlier, most DNS providers do not allow fast flux. So you can give the DNS provider an ultimatum. You can say, kick this person off of your network or we're gonna block your DNS server. So that resulted in a lot of DNS servers kicking fast flux actors off of their network, which meant that the fast flux actors had no choice but to host their own DNS servers on their bulletproof hosts where they couldn't be taken down. But now we're back to the first problem because the DNS server has an IP address, the security people can block the DNS server's IP address, and then no one can look up the malicious domain. So they're back to square one. Instead of blocking the server's IP address, we just block their DNS server's IP address instead, and it has exactly the same effect. So that is where double fast flux came about, and the old fast flux technique got renamed to single fast flux because it only fluxes the IP addresses of the web servers, well, technically the proxy servers, but not the DNS server. But threat actors figured, well, we can host proxy servers on hacked computers. We can also host DNS servers on them as well. So what they started doing is actually using the hacked computers as DNS servers as well. They would tell the TLD server, so let's say it's a .com domain, they would tell the .com TLD server, my DNS server, my authoritative DNS server is this IP address, and the IP address would be a hacked computer. So now whenever someone resolved the domain, the final step, instead of an authoritative DNS server that was hosted at an ISP, it would just be some random person's hacked computer. And that hacked computer would then respond with the IP address of another hacked computer, which would proxy the real server. So now they can not only flux the IP addresses of their servers, but also their DNS servers. Anytime a security provider was able to take down one of those hacked computers or the hacked computer went offline or they blocked its IP address, well, they would just change their authoritative DNS server IP address to another one of the hacked computers. So now your DNS server can have thousands of IP addresses and your web server can have thousands of IP addresses and the security providers aren't going to block the top level domain name server because that would just cause collateral damage. If you were to go and block the .com top level domain server, now you've just blocked every .com domain. What threat actors started doing is bulk registering thousands of domains and pointing them to their fast flux network, which meant if a security vendor blocked a domain, they would just swap it out for a new one. If they blocked an IP address, they would swap that out for a new one. If they blocked a DNS server, and you get the picture, there's basically nothing there that can be blocked that they can't simply change very quickly. Now, because the threat actor's real server with their database and their website on it is hidden behind this network of ever-changing DNS servers and ever-changing proxy servers, it makes it very, very resistant to takedown and also very, very resistant to IP block lists. So that's when security providers came up with something known as DNS reputation, because the chances are if you go to a website, pick any website, it's probably been around for five years at minimum, maybe 10, 20. It's probably been around for a long time. If you're gonna read the news, you might go to CNN, New York Times, BBC. If you're gonna search the internet, you might go to Google, DuckDuckGo, Bing. If you're gonna watch my YouTube videos, you might go to youtube.com. All of those domains have been well established for a very long time. They have a very long paper trail and a very long history. So what security companies started doing is rather than just blocking known bad domains, they started blocking unknown domains because the chances are if a web address was registered a week or a month ago, not many people are going to be going to it yet. That's a brand new website that someone has just set up. And if it suddenly has a lot of users, it's probably malicious. It's probably a botnet command and control server or a phishing website. So what they started doing is allow listing known good domains. Like if a domain isn't listed on Google, that's a pretty big red flag. If it was registered too recently, that's a pretty, pretty big red flag. So all of these signals started going into this system known as DNS reputation. But of course there are edge cases because if I go and set up a brand new website and I want to work on my website at work, they should tell me to stop doing that and do my real job. But let's say they don't, 
well, my domain is now blocked because it's very new. It doesn't have a long paper trail. It might not be listed on Google yet, but I could just go and ask the IT administrator to allow that domain. It's gonna happen so infrequently that it isn't a huge effort to just allow the good new domains. So FastFlux today is mostly addressed if you have a security solution. Now, the problem is a lot of organizations just don't. They just don't do cybersecurity. And that is why I think the NSA released this press release because FastFlux is pretty forgotten about and a lot of people don't know the threats of it. It bypasses a lot of traditional firewalls that are based on IP blocking rather than domains. And even if you're doing domain blocking, that's vulnerable to bulk registering brand new throwaway domains. Now, as to why it would be the NSA that would release this warning, we don't know. That would be classified, but we can hazard a guess. Now, my guess is it has something to do with the way APTs or advanced persistent threats have been evolving. Typically in the past, nation state actors didn't have to do any of this because they were mostly doing targeted hacking. They would set up a server, hack a few companies, get whatever data it is they need, then burn down that server, set up a new one and rinse and repeat. They never needed to worry about hosting huge botnets or very public phishing pages that all the security researchers are trying to take down or block. They were keeping their hacking subtle and low level enough that most security people weren't even aware of what servers were being used. And because these targeted attacks went after so few companies at a time, by the time the company notices they've been breached and they've gone, oh, look, this web address or this IP address was responsible for breaching our network, and they've told the security companies and the security companies have blocked those IPs or those domains, well, the threat actors have already long moved on. They've burned down those domains, they've burned down those servers, they've set up new ones, and then hit another small batch of companies. So it was basically just playing whack-a-mole. But more recently, certain nation state hackers have been getting a lot more aggressive. Rather than just doing small-scale targeted attacks, they've been mass hacking systems, building botnets, and doing all of the sort of stuff that you would have typically seen in cybercrime rather than in espionage. So now a lot of the old techniques that were previously only used by cyber criminals to build botnets or spam uh, ads for little blue pills that make things hard for IT administrators as well as the people who have to stop them from buying them or the phishing pages, it's now being used by nation states to hack organizations for espionage purposes, which is a national security risk. We now have to be way more concerned about these old cybercrime techniques, such as like peer-to-peer -peer botnets, IoT devices, fast flux networks, because they're now being used by highly sophisticated nation state actors to conduct espionage. So that is my theory. I don't know for sure because I don't know what classified information prompted this release, but I would suspect it is very much to do with APTs evolving into the cyber criminals of old. Now that is all I have for you today. This is a pretty long-winded video, so I appreciate it if you got this far. Now, if you feel like you learned something from the video, please send me a like or subscribe. It super helps my channel and I will be back with some more videos shortly.